year when I, when I came and spoke. Today, uh, I'm going to talk about technology, a little bit about, last time I talked a lot about my career and you asked me a lot about career stuff. Today I thought I'd spend a little more time on what I call disruption and kind of disruptive events that are caused by technology and what's going on in the world. And then in particular, I was going to focus on disruption and kind of banking and finance, which is what I, which is what I want to do. Um, but I thought, I'd, I thought I'd actually start with answering the last question I had last time from someone in the class, and then Chris Winters came in and asked me the same question. So <laughs> can I get to the next slide? Uh, yeah, it's a, if you hit the tab on the top left there. You can do it on the computer, too. Uh, up here? Yeah. I don't know why we didn't use smart rules of work. They're so, that's, that's They're so cool. fun. <laughs> so, in thinking about colleges, and everybody can say, well, does it matter what college I go to for my career? And it was funny, I was getting the train home last night, and I sent Matt this. <laughs> there was a study done to say, no, it doesn't matter which school you go to. What matters is what you study at the school. And so the study over 20 years shows, uh, I guess, success measured in terms of money, which is not the only form of success. <laughs> Let's just use that for now. <laughs> And what it tracks is basically along the bottom, it's how difficult are the schools to get into. And I guess when they're really easy, they're not considered great schools, and when they're really hard, they're considered really good schools. But the bottom line is, it doesn't matter which school you go to. If you study engineering, computer science, and math, you're in the orange section, and you're going to do a lot better than the people who study arts and humanities. So I wanted to back up my answer <laughs> to my question last year with actual Data. And Matt knows that I'm a big believer in technology and learning to code and applying that and changing the world. And I started as, I did a computer science degree, I started as an actual coder, I built systems myself and then went on to manage larger groups and, and, and so on and so on. And then recently I, I, I started a, a startup in the financial services world. Well. As my mother said to me 20 years ago, learn to program, you'll get a job anywhere. And she was absolutely correct. That's the only thing she was correct on. And it, it, it is absolutely true. But it, it, <laughs> and it is that, and, and, and what has been even more amazing is just the exponential growth of that uh, over the last two, three, four, five years. So kids coming out of college who can code, that's another. So, just something to think about, and the demand for those people uh, just continues to grow. So, everybody I know in my business, in most other businesses, their only impediment to growing their business, or changing their business, or revolutionizing their business is their ability to hire programmers or coders, people who can build what's going on in the future. So, that's what I wanted to start with, and just, I don't know what you're all thinking about, where you're going and what you're going to do, but uh, I'll start with a little bit of career advice, so I'm always uh, an advocate for uh, those types of study and, and getting a job. So, I'm going to give lots of time for Q&A this time, I didn't last time, so let's get into it. I thought I'd lead into the kind of disruption that's going on in financial services and, and Finance with starting with maybe some other industries. Does anybody, I mean, you guys are living and breathing it, but you know, industries are being disrupted by technology right in front of us. I don't know, can anybody think of ones that you guys are seeing right now? Right. Is there a blockbuster run out of business because Netflix? Very good. So, a piece of technology that was able to, well, their first, they did it twice actually. They did First of all, they were able to use technology to uh, mail you know, videos backwards and forwards. But then they very quickly switched to, they had a piece of technology that was able to stream video, whole business. Um, in the same vein, music, the music industry is being decimated completely. 
turned upside down by technology. Basically twice. So the first time was when Napster came along. People were able to, the really first thing was they were able to digitize music, right? Somebody created this thing called MP3. So somebody was able to create a piece of technology that put a song onto a, onto a file. And then this guy creates Napster, which allows people to buy and sell, well, borrow and lend, whatever. So the first piece was take music away from what it was, create it in a file, and then everybody has access to it. And then the second thing that happened was streaming and streaming services. So it's happened twice. And why do people, why, it's, it doesn't just happen because of a piece of technology. It happens because I think people look at those industries and they think, wow, there's just all this, this money and inefficiency and all sorts of things. And maybe we can create a piece of technology that like completely disintermediates that whole space. And it changes, it basically changes, and this is happening in all kinds of other industries, right? Um, uh, hotels, right? They, they, they've been, they're going through their second nightmare right now. Their first nightmare was uh, things like Expedia, Kayak, Hotels.com, Priceline, which took all their prices that were sort of, they kept under wraps, that's how they made money and just pulled all their prices and showed everybody, everyone's prices. So now all the hotels were like, oh, we have to compete on price as well as a whole bunch of other things and everything's out there in the, in the public, you know, for the public to see. So just based on a piece of technology. And the second piece of technology was Airbnb, which is happening right now. So whereas you, you know, want to, uh, you know, go and stay somewhere, the, 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 you had limited choice in the past, now you can just on your phone, I want to go to Savannah for the weekend and, and, and you have a lot of choice. So, you know, that's another industry, I mean, the taxi industry, who would have thought? No, I mean, Uber is now worth 40 billion and we can talk about why it's valued so high in a second, but if you combine Uber with Lyft and a bunch of others that are coming along, their combined valuation it's probably worth more than the whole taxi industry combined. So I don't even know how you would value the taxi industry. But they basically used a piece of technology to completely change, you know, the way something was done. So those are, you know, the medical profession. Right? You've got ZocDoc. You can find a, 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 a doctor anywhere using like a piece of technology. So these things are sort of happening all around us. And the other thing that changes with those things is it is it takes out layers in between. I'm going to talk about that. In a, takes all these layers. And in the, in the old days, if you were an artist, you had to go to a, 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 a record company and some executive would decide whether you were worth recording and then another bunch of executives would decide how you got distributed and another bunch of executives would decide where it got sold and then another bunch of companies would put them in the record store. And all those layers took out money and arguably took out talent that now you can just get your song recorded at home, put it on YouTube, and immediately be exposed to the world. And now the consumers decide, not record company people, not people in the middle of these things. And there's a very good example of that in, in banking in the second. So, you know, for me, I'm a, I'm a big believer in technology and transforming, and it's hard to pick next. I mean, I don't have a crystal ball, and I'm not sure if you guys do, but getting involved in you know, new things that are coming along is kind of where the future is. And of course, there's a there's hundred examples of, you know, many of these firms doing very well. Of course, there's hundreds of examples of many of them like not working. But you have to keep trying with these kinds of things. So, um, so there's all kinds of industries being turned upside down by technology and by people like you who just have thought, hey, you know, I can think of a different way of doing something. I can like build something and change it. I mean, Spotify was, you know, a couple of kids who just coded up this thing that said, hey, why don't you just, you know, push streaming music out there and, and let everybody decide what they want to listen to. And now the radio industry is completely done. You know, who, who, now, the, now the music selling, everybody I know, so iTunes was the biggest record music seller it in and of itself was a major innovator and transformer of the way you buy music, is now almost gone. 
in a space of like a year or two. So, so all kinds of examples of you know disruption of things. Any any other ones that you guys can think of? I mean, gaming is, is kind of being completely turned upside down. You used to have to go buy stuff, put it in your player, and now it's like all online. It's on the phone. So even the 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 the, the early, even the even a, a thing where for us old people it's like games themselves were like a new thing. Even those you know, the way they used to be are being completely changed, and now you can do it you know on your phone. So that that's changed completely. Let me talk a little bit about my space. This is a little bit busy. I'm a big believer in simple slides. <laughs> I really apologize. But it hit me the other day. I saw this, and I don't want you to try and decode it too much. But basically, somebody said, OK, the industry that's been least affected, but is probably likely to be most affected over the next few years is financial services. And that's where I grew up. I worked for a big bank, Merrill Lynch Bank of America, or Deutsche Bank. And we had a very traditional model for kind of making money, right? You, you, you take deposits on one side, pay them very little, and then you lend money on the other side and you charge them a lot. And that, that essentially uh, is banking. And there are many different products and ways of doing that that seem sort of complicated, um, bonds, equities, but ultimately that's all, it's all kind of the same thing. And this struck me because Basically, over the last five years, you know, they said there's basically hundreds of little firms, and I know a lot of the firms on here because I meet with them and talk with them, who want a piece of that. They don't, it's probably not like the taxi industry where there's just one app that will just completely change it. And by the way, they still have taxis, they just, you just find a taxi a different way. So that's not necessarily changed, but the way you go about it has changed. Instead, with banking and financial services, they, they call it unbundling. But basically, instead of looking at the whole thing, they just looked at pieces of it and said, well, like a big piece of banking these days is like wealth management. So, so eventually, everybody's going to have some money and they need it managed by someone. And typically, and in my day, it's like, you know, your parents take you down, you open the bank account bank and one day you have some money and then you go from a bank to like a regular account and then you get a job and maybe you have you create like a portfolio and you do some investments and stuff like that <laughs> and the bank makes lots of money out of all that it's all good but people have looked at that and said well let's look at like portfolio management let's look at managing stocks and bonds and investing and we can write software that can do that much much better much much better and it's cheaper so you have no humans you just put your money in the, in, the, in, the, in the thing, you tell them how much risk you want to take, and a piece of technology can, can in nanoseconds, decide which stocks you should buy, how long you should hold them, based on history, all kinds of stuff. And the person who used to drive around in a Porsche because they were managing managing your money, lot, you know, is, is, is quaking right now. They're shaking because a piece of technology can really do something much better than they can and so all, lots of pieces of this are being taken apart. And there's one, a couple in particular I want to talk about, but I don't know if you've heard of them. But one is called Prosper and one is called Lending Club, and they both do the same thing. They, one day this guy woke up and he said, I don't get it. I put my savings in the bank account. Do you have a, does anyone have a bank account? Okay. Do you know how much money you earn on any money that goes in there? Yeah. Zero. I'll tell you right now. <laughs> you, you, they'll, they'll give you no, now, we, are, we live in an era of low interest rates, which is a whole different macroeconomic thing, but generally you get nothing. Does anyone have a credit card? Right. Do you ever see, the, you ever see the, the, the amount they charge you on the credit card? Uh, no. Right. Well, it's like 20%. Now, how's that possible? And so this guy woke up and he said, well, this is just incredible. And if you pay back your credit card every month, a lot of people don't. So basically, at the heart of this thing are trillions of dollars of savings, or 
money in the bank, and on the other side, trillions in credit card debt. And that's how the top 50, all of the banks, most of them make most of their money. Okay, so this person woke up and he started a firm called Lennon Club. And basically he said, well, credit card debt is just borrowing money. You're just borrowing money. How about I build a piece of software that allows people who want to borrow money to connect with people who want to lend money. Lending money means just putting it in a bank account. And instead of using people, like if you want to borrow money from a bank, either through a credit card or just borrow it, you have to go in and interview and all that, and it takes a lot of time and it's expensive. How about they just put their details in here, and I have an algorithm that decides based on not just yes or no, but yes at a certain interest rate. And so Prosper and Lending Club have absolutely taken off because they're just using software to decide where you want to put your money. So when you put your savings in, you don't really get a choice. When you go to Lending Club, you put $1,000 in there, it says, do you want to lend that out? Well, of course, that's why I came in here. Okay, you can lend it to people who are buying engagement rings, people who are starting a business, you can lend it to people, you don't see their names, but basically it's called peer-to-peer -peer lending. So it's just like me lending you $100 and me lending you $100. And because I know you defaulted on me once before, I'm gonna charge you 15% interest, but because you did it, I'm only gonna charge you 10% interest. And that's what the software does. So people can't do that, or well, if they do, it's really slow and expensive, so banks can't do it. But a piece of software can do it. And Prosper and Lending Club, they are basically doubling their business every month because they're able, and all they do is take one, instead of taking 20%, they take 1% because it's all software, it's all technology, and they have no cost whatsoever. So things like that are going on, and they just basically make this algorithm better and better mm -hmm. so that both sides know exactly what's going on, and both sides get the best deal, and these guys get the best deal as well. And what happened was there was about five years ago, a whole lot of them, Prosper Lending Club, there was about 20 others, all started exploding a business. But the regulators, so here's, what's get, here's what gets in the way of technology. People, people usually get in the way of technology, right? It's, it's not technology that's the problem, it's usually people, right? It's like EasyPass was invented years ago, but we still, for some reason, had people at the booth where <laughs> you would get, how is that, how is that possible? Well, the, you know, the union and someone else decided that this technology was dangerous, so we had to keep paying people to, so that's, that's still a, a, an issue I have. Why does that go on? So people got in the way of this technology. Basically, a whole bunch of regulators got together who the banks paid and said, you need to take these people down because it's dangerous for people. And they shut them all down, except for Prosper and Lending Club, who got some last gasp whatever, and managed to survive, and that was about four years ago. Now, since then, they have survived, and they've grown, and grown, and grown, and grown. And others are now back in business and trying to grow that space. So basically, they're gonna take the banking business and go, we're gonna, t we're gonna, we're gonna create a piece of technology that's gonna just do all of the borrowing and lending because you guys, with your thousands of people, just can't do it, and they're gonna continue to revolutionize what borrowing and lending. And Essentially, this diagram basically just takes every piece of what a bank does and it shows half a dozen startups that are trying to like eat into that space. Wealth, managing people's money is probably the biggest. The second biggest is probably payments. So there's been pr plenty of like innovation on the front end of payments, but at the back end, it all still goes through bank accounts. So if you use, anyone use Apple Pay now? Or Square Cash? Yeah. Nope. Yes, yeah, right. Square Cash, yeah. So if I want to give you some money, I can take my phone out and I can email you money using Square Cash, right? And so the innovation at the front end is pretty good. And it seems really cool. And it seems that, you know, the world is changing. But behind that, it's not. What is happening is the Square Cash and the Apple Pay is still connected to a credit card, and the credit card is connected to a bank. <laughs> so there's about eight layers behind what's going on, and everybody's getting a piece of that. So, so, so if I give you $100 through Square Cash, you do get the $100. But Square has to pay 20 cents to someone in the credit card business, and the credit card pays 20 cents to the bank, and then the transaction fees to the bank. So I would say there are 
thousands of people, thousands of companies trying to get into that space. Does anybody who cracks that? Um, so anybody who you know can crack that um, is 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 going to do very well. And I think that the, the, the at the heart of that are a couple of things that may completely revolutionise this. And this is Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies. So does anyone know anything about those? Right. So Bitcoin is like money online. That's right. Um, money online. So all of this all of this infrastructure, all of the billions that are spent today still revolves around moving money around banks and clearing money and moving it and a cr an online cryptocurrency. Well they, they it's it's like um, uh, you know certain brands. I don't know, clean film or something. But it's, it's, they, they, Bitcoin is a brand. Bitcoin is one of them, but there are many that are coming along, and um, so they call them cryptocurrencies as a as a generic kind of term. And, and Bitcoin may not be the one that, that, that survives. It may not be the one. But essentially, like a lot of those other things, if you can create a piece of technology that represents the movement of value, you're going to completely blow this thing up. You're going to completely and utterly blow it up. So, so there's a lot of, as usual, uh, the first thing that comes along is, 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 is create a sense of fear. So banks, industry, government, everybody else will tell you, first off, you know, this is dangerous, right? Like, like you know, like streaming radio is dangerous or something. So they'll, they'll try and create a sense of, you know, I don't know, world collapse when actually, you know, it's pretty, pretty innovative. So don't listen to any of that. Um, and there may be people who have some accidents and lose money along the way. But ultimately, I think um, having an ability to, uh, you know, transact stuff without using that is like the future. That's, that's, you know, the other day I had to send someone from New Zealand, I sent some money home. It was, I don't know, they charge me like, you know, $200. <laughs> Just charge me $200. And, and, and it's, it's just, it's just a, a, you know, a transaction on these wire. Nobody did anything. No human got involved in it. Why did they charge me $200? Because they can. Because I had nowhere else to go. And that's typically why these places make a lot of money. Now, I've done very well out of the banking industry, so I don't want to be, and, and I do a lot of business with them. But right now, my focus is shifted to doing a lot of business with many of these firms. I met the head of the Bitcoin New York Center, so I didn't even know they had one the other day. So there's a Bitcoin Center in New York on Wall Street. You can go visit it. And Bill right, I didn't know. I, I didn't know that either. <laughs> and they have a, 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 a Bitcoin machine. It doesn't actually produce like a coin, but it shows you how the, the technology works. Um, so they planted themselves right in the middle of Wall Street, which is pretty interesting. Um, so, you know, I think there's uh, hundreds of startup firms and pieces of technology that are trying to get, change the way we do things. And that's going to be pretty successful in and of itself. But then I think underneath that is this, if we can move to a, like, you know, this, this um, cryptocurrency world where, you're not moving money around. And, I, and I, you know, and I think that will go hand in hand with a whole bunch of other things like, I don't know, I think people today ask, why do I need a credit card? Why do I need a bank account? I don't understand this bank account structure. These bank accounts are the same as they were 100 years ago. You know, I set one up for my kids the other day. I don't know why I did it. And they don't understand it because it's like, well, the, you need two accounts. You have a savings and a check account. They're like, what's a check? Like, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know why, who do, who, why do you have that? And then they start spending money, and the, the card bounces because the money was in one account, not the other account. It's like, what? Why don't you just move? What, what is this? So that's the dark ages, right? So, so I think young people today are, 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 are going to have nothing to do with that anyway. So they're going to be, you, you are going to like look at all these new things. And I think the other thing is you're going to look at all these things and you're going to have choice and it's not going to be like it used to be. 
It's not going to be where you open a bank account, you stay with them forever, and you get your mortgage from them, and then you get your, you know, your loan from them, and then you get your retirement fund because, you know, I don't know, my dad banked the city, so I banked the city. That's not the way it's going to be. I think in the future, you will, I don't know, you might bank with PayPal or eBay or, you know, Prosper or, I don't know where, you, you don't you may need to put your money anywhere. I mean, things may be completely different, and then you may decide that you borrow money and prosper and you may get a mortgage and people may bid. So all this stuff is going to change. So I think in terms of, you know, what I'm looking at right now and where I'm working right now is in, is in all these other smaller firms and looking at which ones are going to be big and which ones are going to change the world. And, you know, so I wanted to just kind of expose you guys to a little bit of that. I don't know what you're thinking about. You don't have to decide. Okay, people ask you for it. What are you going to do when you grow up? So people still ask me. I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> How do you know at this age? Matt knows he's going to be a. He's been an app entrepreneur. <laughs> <laughs> so, have any questions so far? Yes. What do you think about like security issues? I think they'll get worked out. You know, I think uh, I think banks get robbed. You know, I think I think people work. I think someone. You know, I think a lot of people work on that. So, on. and I think like a lot of things, uh, like if I was going to invest money using some of these, I'd spread them out. So maybe for a few years you spread things out, right? You just you just spread your risk anyway. It's not like. I go home today. And I'm like, hey, honey, we're going to sell the house and put everything in Bitcoin. <laughs> so I think you, you, both sides are careful, but you know, uh, people are going to people are going to work on it. And people are going to set up protections, and they're going to take a chance with it. Well, I think it's a little risky to put money in something that's not backed by like, the government, like the U.S. dollar is backed by the government. Um, I think we do that every day. You know, I think you buy stuff you. Invest in your house. You people take chances, big chances every day. I think there is risk in that, and I think that's the main. Like when I first started reading about, it, hearing about it, I'm like, it'll never work. I said it. Again, it's not backed by like a federal. There's no backstop down the road. And then they did somebody did lose a lot of money and they lost it. Um, I, I I think there are just many things out there that aren't backed, and I think for a lot of people just transacting stuff and money and getting charged for it, that's gonna, it's gonna, Bitcoin's gonna outweigh that. They're just gonna go, you know, this is just better. And yeah, I mean, I think if uh, something's sitting on top of it and they basically backstop it, maybe somebody else backstop it. Yeah. But I think, it's, I think it'll get worked out. And I think the federal government is actually already involved reasonably Fed has got a little task force, um, which I think is great, because um, I think you can't ignore the stuff. You have to like be there and be involved. They're not backing anything. They're not saying, "Oh yeah, go use Bitcoin." Um, but ultimately, in life, you know, you can't have everything backstop, right? You just some so so. Changing gears ever so slightly, yes. you are an expert in the hiring of computer programmers. For, uh, yes, I am. Yes, you are. <laughs> uh, and most of the people watching this video are going to be computer programmers. So what advice do you have for future computer programming students uh, if they're looking to get a job? Aside from it, it doesn't matter where, it matters what. Yeah, I, uh, I've hired hundreds of uh, computer programmers and continue to. I have a startup now, we're trying to hire right now. We're looking for, I'll talk right to the video. <laughs> three, there it is. Three new programmers <laughs> at the hottest startup in New York City. Um, the things I look for are, are I want to see that you've done something, like you've built stuff. That's probably the most important thing. Like, I, 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 don't, care, I don't care what it is. I think you've gone through the cycle of idea through coding, even while you're at school. You know, I don't. Most people I've hired are already out of school. They've already worked for two or three years. But I still. Um, hey, good morning. I. Uh, I 
I still look for that. I look for, you know, I built this, I, I, I built this thing, I ran this project, I had this idea. Uh, I look for people taking a little bit of risk with that on the side, so maybe it was a little, a little different. I don't mind if people you know, weren't successful with it, um, but that's generally what I look for. Um, I look for uh, someone who has ideas in the meeting. So if I'm interviewing someone, what, what, tell me, tell me why you want to work here. Tell me what industry you want to work in. Tell me why you chose that industry. Do you have other ideas for industry? So be, be very expansive and be very open with like ideas. Do some research on the place that you're going to interview at, so that there's a connection um, you know, when you get there. Not, don't overdo it. Don't you know, recite the balance sheet that you looked up online to show that you did <laughs> like hours of study. But at least know what the place does. Hey, I know what you do. I want to work here because of. And generally, I look for. That passion, that interest, someone who's done something, but you've actually proved you could write code and, and you've done it in a, in a, in a project and has a, a genuine interest for you know, working in this particular space is typically what I look for. So I'll show Chris the slide I brought. I, I, oh, yeah. I, I started today, <laughs> your benefit, answering the question you asked me last time. Oh, yeah. So, I wanted to uh, I'll show these guys this study, which I just found last night. You asked me, does it matter which school you went to? And I don't know if you saw this, but I just pulled it up last night. There was a study done over the last 20 years which shows, no, it doesn't matter which school you go to. It matters what you study. And over the last 20 years, the reds are everybody who did engineering, computer science, and math typically do better than, and, and, and the line is straight because these are the schools along the bottom, how hard they are to get into, and it, and it remains pretty flat. So, depending on what people are thinking about doing and where they're going, um, you know, I thought that was very interesting. So, in terms of getting a job, yeah, that's what I look for. Any other thoughts? Yeah. Oh, one question about the chart, actually. Oh, yeah. Um, the, uh, on the left, it says the first um, annual return on degree right. as a percentage. Yeah. But at a lot of the harder schools, um, the paying for the school. So they flattened that out. So they basically flattened out the cost of the school. So, so for, even though it cost higher, the return was still higher. So right, right, you're right. able to pay it back. My point is that, um, but if you went to, like, a, say, a really expensive but right. also really selective school, and say you get, like, the extra twenty percent is going to be more than one hundred percent. You make it back in the cheaper school. Uh, maybe. <laughs> but the sense was, um, you know, it's it just ma it matters. And and Matt asks me every year, and we come back to the same. The demand right now for engineering, computer science, uh, is insatiable. So. Previous career, we you know, hired hundreds, and you know, currently right now we're looking at every one of those th in every one of these businesses I talk to in the what they call fintech or financial technology industry is is looking and can't find people. Um, how soon do you think like the demand for like programmers and computer scientists will like decrease? <laughs> no. So in 1956, they invented COBOL, and they predicted the demise of the computer program in 1956 because COBOL was called Common Oriented Business Language. It looked sort of like English. Um, so every new programming language that comes out, every few years they try and... They, I, I don't see it myself personally. I think there's still so many businesses, so many industries. This one I'm showing in particular all of these smaller startup businesses that are trying to pull banks apart need hundreds of people. Healthcare needs, when you think about how much more technology it needs. When you think about how many doctor's offices you go into, you still see paper files. You still
still see an inability to, uh, you know, measure like body vital signs, transmit them automatically to a doctor or a computer, and for it to understand what's going on with millions of people, and then send you some medicine. I, I, I think there's, I think it's insatiable. For that. Okay. Um, well, to get the thing, this is unbundling of the bank. And yeah. All, like every all the different functions of the bank. Yeah. The industry trying to do that part. Yeah. I can imagine it getting kind of confusing for someone who's trying to, you know, get involved with finance. Right. So I think maybe there's a space for a company which try to try to connect people with all these other companies, like a rebundling of the bank, sort of. <laughs> more convenient and. Uh, it's that. kind of interesting. Um, I think it's probably too soon for that. I think. I think I look at it two. I think I, I, I would look at it two ways. There, uh, there's the banking industry as a whole, and it's trying to recreate and transform itself based on the threat it sees from all these smaller firms. But you know, its ability to move quickly is generally hampered by, like any typical industry, they're onto a good thing. Most of the management is 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 focused on keeping the good thing going. Um, you know, the, the, like, why didn't the taxi company come up with Uber? I mean, it's an obvious, like, why not? It usually takes an outsider who's unencumbered to, you know, with, with fresh thinking and having worked in that industry for many years, many meetings are spent discussing why something can't be done, not why it can't be done. Whereas many of these smaller firms are very nimble, and because they, they're biting off a piece, um, they're able to take that piece with fresh technology, no, no legacy, no regulation uh, yet, and you know, grab that piece. So I'd say there's two sides. I would say what you say is probably going on in the traditional old in banking industry, they're looking across everything they do, and they have this diagram, and they're like, okay, uh, how is it that, that that lending club over there can make so much money, be so valuable, and, you know, we make a lot of money, but it's going down every year, it's going down, going down, so it's, 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 it's um, so I would say they're the ones that are looking at it holistically and trying to change every piece within that. I don't know if they can do it with I don't know if they can race mm -hmm. against all of the smaller ones that are trying to pull it apart. Well, my proposal is more like you, from the other side, you kind of come in as okay. a newcomer and you have the you know the fresh start, the lack right. of regulations, all that. And instead of trying to make like one company that does all of this, you try to make a way to connect the other companies. So like just make it easier for the consumer. Or not the consumer, yeah. But like yeah, maybe. Maybe. That's a good one. <laughs> a virtual bank. All right, you start tomorrow, Bennett. Okay. And, 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 uh. and instead, that's right, actually, that's pretty good. So you have like a virtual bank over here, and it looks like it does all the traditional things, but essentially, each piece of those connects to maybe the best value instead of. Nifty. So, uh, last year when you were here, you had just kind of been launching Untapped and yes, all that. And yes. in the years since, I've seen your Facebook ad. I mean, it's been exciting to watch. Right, right, right. What's been the most exciting and or your favorite part about being right in the middle of it? Uh, I would say the, the, the best part is two, two good things. Making a difference. So you're, you're actually seeing. So, so I, I, I built a recruiting plan. It's an automated, algorithmically driven platform that helps programmers find jobs in there. Okay, so um, I've, I've used many ways to try and describe it, and because my son said to me, Dad, you're just helping programmers find jobs. Why don't you just use that? Okay, so we help programmers find jobs. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> great marketing. You're hired. Uh, so we, uh, we feel ourselves that we're disrupting the recruiting industry. So the recruiting industry in, in, in is like any other industry. Uh, it's, it's many parts of it are high margin, old, manual, whatever. But it's already been attacked on a number of fronts. So talent been monster indeed. Many technologies have tried. We are doing it in a, in a more 
uh, scientific data-driven way. They, they typically just pass resumes around. We're actually analyzing the resumes and connecting them. So anyway, that's the, that's the, the pitch, the sell. Um, yeah, I would say watching the flow, watching people actually get jobs. And then the second part that's been most exciting is actually a lot of these people are my clients. So I actually go talk to them. Uh, and uh, Betterment, Wealthfront, uh, Prosper, um, uh, who else is here? Uh, there's a bunch of them. And, and that's really been the most exciting part because they're... Uh, they're, 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 it's a very collegiate environment. They're, they're very, they're not competing with each other as much as you would think. They're, 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 they have a common kind of thing. They want to, they're all entrepreneurs and they want to do well and they want to disrupt and they want to use technology to do it. So it's very tech focused. That's exciting. And so when you talk to them, they're very interested in what you're doing and, you know, you're very interested in them. So I'd say two things, just getting movement and building something and getting to work with hundreds of, of, of small startup firms that are uh, in the same situation. So that's probably lots of bad things. <laughs> that was the next question. What was your least favorite part? Yeah, I'd say the least favorite is raising money. <laughs> <laughs> that is absolutely, I thought oh, that would be fun. Asking people for for money for you, right? You you start off with a great idea and a great piece of technology and you think, it's obvious, it's great. I just had that great idea and, you know, it's so obvious and I'm going to be next Mark Zuckerberg. <laughs> and then you start, you know, you, you, you ask your friends and rich uncle for some money and you keep going for a couple of months, a couple of months, but you eventually run out. And so the typical route that all of these have gone, and, and now everybody is you go to a venture capital firm. Venture capital firms are, they, they take high risk and they only invent, invest in startups. And their, their mantra is typically they expect one in 20 to do reasonably well. So when they meet you, they expect you to be able to tell them how you're going to turn their investment into 20, you're going to give them 20 times what they give you. Not 20%, 20 times, right? So, so you know, it's not like, hey, I'm opening a coffee shop, you know, this is what the rent's going to cost, this is how much I'm going to sell the coffee for, I'm going to buy it for, and I can promise I'll pay you back. It's, so, I've probably done 50 of those meetings, and that's their sole focus is, I don't get how, if I give you a million dollars to run this firm, how I'm going to get back 20 million. <laughs> so, that's the hardest bit. Crowdfunding, I think, is great. I think it's like every other one of those things I talk about, like music, like connecting, I think that is the future. Because, again, for me, going through that process, I'm, I'm sitting across the table, does anybody watch Silicon Valley? Right. I mean, that is, you have to watch Silicon Valley. They all do, they're just not I'm raising their hands. Do you watch it, man? Yeah, yeah. No, they all do, it's just rated R, so they're not allowed. Oh, is it rated R? Oh. <laughs> okay, they can't say. That's <laughs> Yeah, it's on, a, it's on HBO. It's about a startup in Silicon Valley. And it is so close to exactly what's going on. When they do the so fundraising. It's, so it's exactly how it is. They speak to all these VCs, and they're all the same. They have their sweater with their little zip, their Porsche outside. You know, it, it's. And they sort of. They opine their. The, 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 now, I have to do another round of funding, so do not show this video to any VCs. Um, Wait, it is going. It is going <laughs> online, so you might. Yeah, no. <laughs> and of course, no, the great thing about them is once you connect with them and do business with them, they've all done it before. So typically, they've all done it before, and so they have a lot of you know, input. But again, it's one. Or, it's an opinion of one or two people. Crowdfunding, let the, let the public decide. I think it's much better. And actually, there's been regulations stopping crowdfunding. It's only just over. And again, um, you know, just my opinion, but typically new technologies are feared by regulators and others. So actually, crowdfunding, you, could, you weren't allowed to invest uh, because of a secure, you know, sort of a security thing. But anyway, it's opened up. Um, was it, was someone I saw the other day invented a new cooler, and uh, I don't know how much money he got, 1.3 million or something. It's huge. And, and so he pitched his cooler online, 
and everybody thought it was great. So I think crowdfunding, I mean, I've tried to push for it because these regulations are opening up right now, for, even for us. I said, why can't we push our ideas out there? Because the more people know about it, the more you know interest you're going to generate. And, and so I, to I totally, I think it's I think it's the best way for it. Absolutely. Yeah. I was going to ask. So you, you consult with a lot of these firms, yeah. And, and I would imagine they say to you, "We need um, X, Y, and Z type uh, yeah. employee." And you probably have an opportunity to, to actually have conversations with them around, well, have you thought about particular qualities that you want? Maybe yeah. you don't need just this. You might need some. What do you, what, what's the message that you're sending? What, what, what kind of college graduates are, are those that firms like this need to start hiring to be successful? These are, these are small That's startups right. relatively. That's right. right. That's a great question. I would say actually the most... Uh, the thing I tell them the most is to take college grads as opposed to more experienced people. That's number one. Why? Because there's more of them. <laughs> no, really. Uh, well, because typically when I talk to them, they're, they're, they can't get, they can't hire, they can't find people. That's, so, so most of the conversations are uh, how do we find Python, how do we find C++, how do we, so C++ is old, they don't look for C++, they look for Python or Java. So, uh, maybe C sharp. Maybe there's a discussion around the languages, but typically I tell them to widen their search. It's always about widening their search. Take college grads, take college grads from different colleges, take people from other parts of the country. Always the same. Oh, I hadn't thought that. Oh, well, we don't like to pay for that. Pay for it. Because it's a very small investment. So, so whether you use our platform or some other form, get the word out there. It's like crowdfunding. Get the word out there. Change your criteria. Get them in younger. That's why. That's, that's generally what goes on. Well, I really need five years experience. Really? Do you really need five years experience? Because people with five years experience are earning, you know, three times. And you, you can't afford it and you can't find them. So that's, that's typical. So it's, it's go wider and go wider all the time, is what I tell them. And some of them do. I was meeting with one the other day. They said, basically, twice a year we go to, um, where is it, went? Brooklyn Tech or something? I can't remember what the school's called now. Is it Bronx Science? Bro like Bro Bro Brooklyn, Tech. Brooklyn Tech is another Brooklyn one. Tech. Yeah, it's one of the big He goes, yeah. I set up a desk. He's the founder of one of these firms. He goes, I set up a desk, and I wait. And I've got my sign, and I tell people what we do, them right out of school. High school? No. Um, yeah, well, no, the college is there. What's the college? Brooklyn? Um, oh, I don't know. It's one up from the Brooklyn Tech High School. Okay. Yeah, no, no, one up. One oh, okay, up. okay. I can't remember what it's called. Uh, but for example, so, so, you know, and many of the, of course, many of the traditional banks and industries do college, college recruiting. So many of the startups, they can't afford to do that. Uh, they haven't got the time to do it. So they're up against it, actually, for college grades. But that's where they need to go. So, so in addition to uh, having specific knowledge of particular uh, languages and uh, what other qualities do you consult, do, do you advise to them are important? Like what, what else should they be looking at in someone coming out of college? Uh, or is that it? Just, just super good I think, coding? Well, if the smaller the place, you know, the attitude matters a lot. So... Once, you, once you're through like coding, I can build something. Um, it's, it's about ideas and innovation. So, great, what do you think of that? Program? Like have, have, some, have some view on the world that will resonate. So they're like, yeah, that's what we're about. We're about changing the world. Great, you got a job. You know, um, so I think those things are very important. So, Personally, I mean, I don't know this works for everybody, but um, you know, people have gone and done something. Uh, the other day, I, uh, I interviewed and he's in for a second round. He lived in the Himalayas for three months. He just, he did something, went and did something else. And he told me everything he learned there and what he learned about how he dealt with people. And it was, you know, it was different. And I knew then that he would come in with a different attitude 
opportunity to try different things, and so so I look for that too. I mean, I personally think it's a great thing to have to tell you. Remember to go see the world, but it, it does, it can open your mind a little more, and you can see things a little differently. Um, so I would advocate for that. All right, so we got to let everyone go because that was the bell. But what do we say, guys? Thank you so much. All right.